pray. Father, help us now as we open your word. Cause that the Spirit of God might make it come alive in the heart of every hearer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Imagine going home today and receiving a visit from the U.S. Olympic Committee. Uh, they share with you that they have statistics on everyone in the United States. Uh, and they have statistics from the very first uh, fitness test you did in grade school. Everybody's information is there on their exercise habits, etc. And they have concluded that you, yes, you, are the one person in the United States who could bring home the gold medal in the marathon. Of course, when they came in, you were just eating two Big Macs and an extra large fries <laughs> and two Cinnabons, and you're like, can't they see that the furthest thing from my mind is a marathon? In fact, the furthest I've ever run is from the coach to the refrigerator. The surprise takes you by surprise, you know, but after a while, after a while, you start wondering, what if? What if I was created to run the marathon? What if this is my destiny? And so after a while, a picture flashes in your mind and you see yourself on the podium and the United States flag is going up, the anthem is being played and you're bending down as they're putting that gold medal around your neck and you see the picture. But as you see the picture, you're saying, why me? Why did they choose me? And I want to say to you this morning that God also has a way of choosing the most unlikely person to do special mission. I'm here this morning to say to you young person and to you older person that you might think yourself the most unlikely person that God has for a special mission. But I want you to know you are exactly the person that God wants to choose this morning. You know, in the book of Judges, he went to a guy by the name of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And Gideon was probably the guy uh, chosen as the most likely not to succeed. And so by the time uh, the Lord appears to Gideon, uh, the Bible says Gideon was in hiding. This, this guy was really not supposed to succeed. He is so scared, he's hiding, and the Lord appears to him. And what does the Lord say? Hello, you mighty man of valor. Man, uh, what type? God, you know, God has a way of seeing what we can be, not what we are. A young person, you understand what I'm saying to you this morning? God has a way of seeing what he wants to make of you. Not where you are right now. And so God shows up and he says to, to, to Gideon, Hello, you mighty man of valor. And, and poor little Gideon, he says, I just want you to know, my clan is the weakest clan in Israel. And not my clan is the weakest. And I'm the least person in my clan, which is the least clan. God, you got it wrong. Can you identify with him? Perhaps I'm talking to somebody this morning whose teacher has told you you'll never amount to nothing. Your parent told you, oh, sometimes I meet young people and they tell me their daddy or their mommy says you'll never amount to nothing. But I'm here this morning to tell you it doesn't matter what people say, God says you can amount to something. I'm talking this morning about living a life of significance and I want you to know the God I'm talking about is the same God who allowed a, a Samson to use the jawbone of an ass to slay 1,000 Philistines, a jawbone of a donkey and he used that as his weapon because he was empowered by the living God. And I want you to know whoever you are, the almighty God can empower you to do unbelievable exploits. And so I am trusting that today, as we share this message, living a life of significance, you will start asking the question, what if God would really use me? 
you hear what I'm saying? Would you ask God today, God, what if? You see, you think you're nobody. You have all of these negatives. There are so many issues. There's so much drama in your life. But, but this morning, God is wanting you to ask, God, what if, what if God would use me? Here's the big thing. He does want to use you. You know, there's a big difference. I'm not talking about living a life of prominence. I'm talking about living a life of significance. There's a big difference between prominence and significance. Do you know that some people's nose is prominent? It arrives before they do. But you know, if they lost, they had surgery and reduced the size of their prominent nose, it would make very little difference in their life. But on the other side, you and I have some things that are not very prominent. My kidney, my liver. Have you seen it? My kidney and my liver, these are items that are not very prominent, but they're very significant. I don't want to lose my kidney or my liver. You see, there is a huge difference between prominence and significance. And some people, sadly, and if we're not careful, the world makes us rather have prominence than significance. I watch TV occasionally and I see these crazy people. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to get prominent. And people are willing to put all their trash out in the public. Can you imagine all this stuff? What they call them? Real housewives? <laughs> and everybody has their stuff out and the whole of stuff. I want America to know who I am. The Apostle Paul wasn't looking for prominence, although he became very prominent. He was totally focused on pursuing why God placed him on this planet. And I'm going to say to you, what could give our life more significance than achieving the purpose why God placed us on the planet? I want to ask you, what do you think could possibly give you more significance than achieving the purpose. Wouldn't you like to achieve the purpose? Let me, first of all, let me say this. Did you know that God actually placed you here for a reason? You know, sometimes we never stop to think about that. We, oh, 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 you know, we're just going on. I'm just, I'm just exit. Do you know that there are people in this church who are 60 years old and older and have never really come to grips with the idea that God put them here for a reason, that they're not just here to take up some air, etc., that there is a specific reason why God put you here. And I want you to know there is nothing that could give my life more significance than if I find out and achieve the purpose why God put me on this planet. And that was what Paul was about. He was determined to find out and achieve God's purpose for him on this planet. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, we find him saying these very important words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought what? A good fight. The Apostle Paul, as he comes to the end, he says, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith henceforth. In other words, Paul is saying, I achieved my purpose. I have kept the faith henceforth. He said, there is a, a, a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You know what I love about God? Not all of us can have a life of prominence, but all of us can have a life of significance. Amen. Aren't you glad about that? You can't be sure you will have a life of prominence no matter how hard you try. But you can be sure you can have every single Christian has the possibility. 
every believer can receive a crown of light righteousness. Every believer can hear well done. But it's not automatic. It was now about 58 AD in the passage, today's passage in Acts chapter 20. It was now about 58 AD and Paul was almost at the end of his third and the final missionary journey recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. He had spent three years, about three years in Ephesus during which time God had worked miraculously. And those of you who have been following us through the, the series in the book of the Acts, uh, remember all that took place in the book of the Acts, how, how people, uh, handkerchiefs and all that stuff that uh, Paul had were laid on people and they got healed and all sort of dramatic things happened in, in the book of, in, in, the, in Ephesus and eventually uh, an anti-Paul riot broke out. You remember that? The anti-Paul riot broke out and they, they dragged some of his friends uh, down to the, the central theater and people were shouting, the Bible says, for hours. Uh, we, don't, we don't have time to go back there. But at the end of, the, of all of that drama, Paul eventually left uh, Ephesus and he visited, he went back over to Europe. He visited Macedonia and Greece for a few months and now he was heading for Jerusalem. And on his way to uh, Jerusalem, Paul stopped in this place called Miletus, and he sent to Ephesus. Ephesus was about 36 miles from Miletus, and he sent to, to Ephesus asking the elders of the church uh, to come to visit. Uh, this was an emotional experience because Paul, as I said, had been with them in Ephesus for about three years. He had developed deep relationships with these people in Ephesus, and he knew he would never see them again. And so, Paul is sharing here in Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 in the most transparent way, uh, very personal. You'll find there's hardly any spot in the Acts of the Apostles where you find Paul so open and transparent. And he's so open and transparent, I believe he gives us something that's important to this morning, I believe Paul is sharing with us some steps we must take if we're going to live a life of significance. Paul is actually sharing from his heart some key things about his life. The things that ended up where he could look back at the end and say, I have fought a good fight. So this morning I want to give you three C's. Three keys that Paul shared as he opened his heart to the elders from Ephesus. And to help you remember them, I'm giving each of them, each will be a C. Three C's. Number one, Paul was commissioned. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20 and verse 24. And here's what the Bible says. Are you, are you with me this morning? Acts 20, 24, if you're there, say amen. amen. Paul says, however... I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Did you see that? Paul is saying he has to complete the task that the Lord Jesus gave him. He had been commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself. He had been given a task. You know, when Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, the first question he asked was, Lord, what do you want me to do? You remember that? The first thing he said was, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I just want to ask you this morning, have you ever asked God that question? Have you ever said to God, Lord, come on now. Have you ever said that? Lord, what do you want me to do? to do. Listen, listen good. God has a specific thing he wants you to do. The reason some of us have no idea what our special mission is, is because we have never asked. Are you getting it? We don't know because we have never asked. And it is important that we ask. Now there are certain specific missions but there's also a general mission, some general things that God wants uh, every Christian. Number one, every Christian is commissioned to evangelize. 
every Christian is commissioned to evangelize. Matthew 28, 19, the Lord Jesus says, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Acts 1, 8, you know the passage well, where the scriptures tell us, But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. Every Christian has a responsibility to spread the message. Amen? You sound awfully weak. Every Christian has the responsibility of spreading the message. Amen? Amen. Are you sure? Thank God for all the countless ways we can spread the message of Jesus. And I hope by His grace you are seeking to, to use those. But every Christian, secondly, every Christian is commissioned as a soldier. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, here's what the Apostle Paul says as he talks to Timothy. He says, you therefore, are you with me this morning? You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Number one. A soldier's life includes what? Hardness. A soldier's life includes hardness. There are challenges on the road to heaven. Cheryl and I, we were in Normandy, France, visiting some of the sites where the Allies landed in World War II. And I remember as we stood at Omaha Beach, uh, although it was 60 years or so later than World War II, the German big guns, some of these big guns that the Germans had fired at her men were still secluded in, in, in positions there uh, near the beach. And, and as, we, as we stood and we, 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 we went by where the guns were and we looked out to the beach and you, you could actually form a picture in your mind. You could see the picture. You could almost see our young men coming off those amphibious vehicles trying to make it to the shore and with these Germans in secluded positions just picking them off as they tried to make their way through the water and through all the barbed wire that was put on the beach and you could understand the unbelievable slaughter that took place there that very day as the Allies tried landing on Normandy 10,000 casualties thousand four hundred dead a soldier's life am I on am I, am I on a soldier's life involves what hardness and hardship Christianity is not for sissies Some of you, some of you young fellows, you know, I, 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 in my time I've run into young people who say, you know, some of these guys who think they're so macho, ma macho, macho, man. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be a Christian because this, this is, Christianity is not for sissies. That's why you, you want to see a real man? You better wake up and start following the life of the Apostle Paul as we've been going and seeing this man as he is being brutalized city after city and he keeps going. Did you know what is great? I was such a sissy. You see, if you're a sissy right now, it's okay. Because God can take God can take you in your weakness, in your scared nature, and he can transform you. I don't mean that you won't get scared sometime, you know. Boy, I've been, we've been in some situations we were so scared, it's not funny, but I'm so glad that right then you can reach out to Jesus because the God in the, on the mountain is the valley and the God the same God when I'm feeling safe is the same God when I'm feeling scared and I when I am afraid I will what but listen the 
this life, the mission that God has called you to, it might require hardness. Are you willing? The problem is too many Christians are AWOL. Missing in action. You know, I read, I read somewhere that most Christians are willing to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. Do you know that God doesn't need your advice? He, he need, he, he's looking for some real soul. I want to ask you this morning, young person, young person, an older person, but oh, I, 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 my heart is, my heart aches from the younger generation because would to God, I, by the Spirit's help, we could challenge our younger generation to get fired up about God. To get fired up, I am willing to be a soldier of the cross. My, listen, you want a life of significance? A life, oh my, there's nothing more than to be sure that you're accomplishing the purpose why God put you here. Are you sure? Come on. Are you sure you're accomplishing God's purpose? If not, this morning, I'm going to challenge you at the end. I'm going to challenge you to say, God, I'm willing. I'm willing to be your man. I'm willing to be your woman. God, I want you to demonstrate your purpose for me. I want to achieve your purpose for me. So God, I am willing to be that soldier. I'm willing to be that soldier. Who, although I know it includes hardness. But second, a soldier's life requires focus. Notice what it says. The verse says that we just read in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Oh God help us. Oh God help us. Because part of the problem in the Christian church is that we have become so entangled in the affairs of this life. We are so into stuff. God has now taken the back seat because the driver, what is motivating me is the affairs of this life. My Bible says, listen, no man, listen, it says, no man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who enlisted him. Oh, I wonder this morning, are you willing to say, God, I am willing to go your way. God, I want to please you. The problem is the more we try and please ourselves, I'm going to let you into a secret. Down the road, you'll find out the less pleased you really are. You see, you were created for a purpose. And until you find and achieve and determine to go and achieve God's purpose for you, there is always going to be something missing in your life. And so I am trusting God that today you will stop fighting, stop kicking against the pricks and submit to God. You know, we were in a group recently discussing issues. We were in Tennessee and we were discussing issues in our society that are causing great concern as Christians. And a female attorney uh, piped in, and she had a very interesting perspective. She said, here's what she said. She said, just imagine how much God must trust us. Of course, everybody perked up. Just imagine how much God must trust us that he has chosen us to be his soldiers in these very challenging times. Stop. You know, sometimes Christians get together in their little huddles, the holy huddle. And all we do in the holy huddle is talk about how bad things are and how things are going from bad to worse. And here's what we forget. That God has put us as the soldiers 
here in these challenging times. God has, God actually trusts us, brothers and sisters. He trusts us. But here's how the lady ended her little statement. She said, each of us just needs to make sure we man our battle stations. Did, did you hear her? She says, God has put us here for some challenging times. He trusts us. The key is, every soldier needs to make sure they are manning their station. Are you manning your station? Are you manning your station? Or are you allowing the enemy to rush through? Are you manning your station? Are you taking a stand for God? Are you standing strong for God? Are you a good soldier? But second, not only was Paul commissioned, Paul was crucified. Here's what he says in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Let me pick up at verse 22 this time. And the Apostle Paul says, Now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. But, 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 but don't miss this. He says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship is facing me. The Apostle Paul says, listen, what I know, I know something. I know that what's ahead is nothing but trouble. So, of course, what would you do? Don't answer too loud. But here's what the Apostle says. However, I consider my life what? Worth nothing to me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I must be honest with you as I read some of this. Can I be honest? This is a huge, this passage of scripture shook me, kicked me around, beat me up a little bit. Because I, I have to ask before I come to share this with you, I have to ask myself, God, am I there yet? The apostle says, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race. Uh, are, you, are you with me this morning? Paul says, I don't count my life worth anything. My focus is is to finish the race. I am so focused on doing my mission for God that I'm not going to hold my life dear. You know, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, he has a powerful statement. And here's what he says in Galatians chapter 2, 20. I, what? Read with me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is what? No longer I who live but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The basis of Paul's determination was that he knew what it means to be crucified with Christ. Are you with me? Paul didn't need to crucify himself. That was already done. When Christ was crucified, Paul is saying, when Christ was crucified, I was crucified with him. I have been crucified with Christ. You know, when this, when this seeps deep into our cranium, you know, some of this, the challenge that we have is, to, is for this theology to seep its way into our cranium till it works its way into our heart. This is not theology. That's to just stay as theology. When this sinks into our cranium, it impacts the way we think. Listen, my brother and my sister, we are crucified. Did you know that? So what does that mean? Let me just say two things. We could preach a message just on this. Two things. My old life must be put away. Paul says, it's no longer I who live. Did you see that? 
It's no longer I who live. The big I has been crucified. Stop trying to resurrect the big I. Amen. Stop trying to hold on to the world on the road to heaven. My old life must be put away. And second, he says, my new life is all about Christ. I have been crucified. The eye is dead. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Aren't you living? Uh, I hope that is here. He, he, he says, yeah, I have been crucified, yet I'm really living. But the Apostle Paul says, but it's not really me who is living. I, I don't want you to miss this. Don't wake, wake up if you're sleeping. He says, I'm crucified, but I'm alive. But wait, it's not I who am living. It's Christ who is living in me. Do you know you can't live the Christian life? Do you realize I cannot live the Christian life? You say, Brother Brian, and if I can't live it, why are, you, why are we coming to church and you're doing all this preaching? If I cannot live the Christian life, we may as well pack up the Bible and go home. Not just yet. Here's what Paul is trying to say. Paul says, I am crucified. I'm living. But it's not me who is living. It's Christ who is living in me. Amen. Guess what? Are you still awake? Christ has no problem living the Christian life. Get it? Absolutely no problem living the Christian life. Brother Brian, make it plain. Paul is trying to get us to realize that the victory happens when I realize it's not about me and I allow Jesus to live his life through me, I am yielded. This is all tied in with the whole idea of being walking in the Spirit. I am walking in the Spirit. I'm yielded to the control of the Holy Spirit. I'm allowing God, I'm allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to live His life through me. So therefore the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. It's a walk of faith. Am I making any sense? It's a life of faith. And so the apostle Paul says, listen, I am crucified. He says, listen, as a result, my whole life is gone. I'm not going to try and cling on to my whole life. Oh, somebody here this morning needs to say to God, God, I'm going, I'm going to stop clinging to my whole life. God, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Put, I'm going to stop clinging. But he says, it's not, not only is the old life gone, he says, my new life is all about Jesus. I am so focused. The song used to say, I am wrapped up, tied up what? Tangled up in Jesus. Anybody know that one? Wrapped up, tied up. Tangled up in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Somebody say amen. When we get to the point where it's all about Jesus, where I'm yielded to the control of Jesus, something starts happening in my life and suddenly, little by little, I start not making my life so dear to me. Do you know that's one of the reasons that we sometimes don't achieve God's purpose? Are you with me? is because our lives are too dear. We regard our lives as being too dear. We, we, where, where, where? I'm holding on. I think I read somewhere in the Bible where Jesus said, whoever will save his life 
we lose it. Matthew 16, 25. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Listen, God is not saying go commit suicide. He's not going to say rush out and run in front of a car. No, he's saying when we start releasing our lives to him and say, God, it's about you. Lord, I'm willing to commit my life to you. And I'm willing to do what you want me to do. God, I'm not going to be holding on. On April 3rd, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was speaking at the Mason Temple Church of God in Christ in Memphis. He climaxed the message with these electrifying words. You know it, don't you? Here's what Dr. King said. Like anybody, I would, love, I would, I would like to live what? A long life. Dr. King said, long, oh, I wish I could talk like Dr. King. Oh, I wish I could. Longevity has its place, he said. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want what to do God's will. That's what he said. He said, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked and I've seen the promised land. I may not go there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And then he said, and so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Listen. When you are in the purpose of God for your life, you don't have to hold your life dear. And I want to tell you, if you were to go back to your history books and study the people who we think so highly of, some of the great, the people who have made such an incredible difference in our society, you will find out that these men of history, and these men and women of history, have been men and women who have not held their lives dear. So the question is, are you going to keep clinging? Or are you going to say, God, God, here is my life. God, here's my life. Take it. Please, God, use me. Please, God, I want to have a life of significance. God, I want to achieve the purpose why you made me. God, I'm willing to pay the price. But finally, Paul was commissioned. Paul was crucified. But Paul was committed. And so here in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 24, we read it before, but we're going to read it again. He says, How have I considered my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul found joy. He says, I may finish with joy. Do you see that? Paul found joy in his commitment to finish his race. Listen, 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 listen. Young person, there is joy in serving Jesus. There is joy in knowing you're pleasing God. Somebody ought to say amen. There is joy in knowing you're pleasing God. There's joy in knowing that your life has significance. There's joy when you can finish your life with no regrets. Verse 26 and 27, Paul says, Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. My goodness, what a joy it is. Can you imagine what it must be like to finish your life with no regrets? God gave you, told you you only had 24 hours to live. I am sure some of us here would have regrets about all the opportunities we missed for God. But thank God he's giving us another chance today. But before I close, 
If you're here and you're not saved, Paul has a special message for you. Look at verse 21. Verse 21, he says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, listen. You can't live a life of significance. No matter what the world tells you, you cannot achieve God's purpose for your life without coming to Jesus Christ and experiencing his salvation. It is impossible to achieve God's purpose unless you are S-A-V-E-D. Are you saved? Are you sure you're saved? Are you sure that if you died, you would go to heaven? Paul tells you how. You know how you get saved? He says, listen, it's about repentance. It's about turning away from your sin and turning to God. God, I want you to know that I'm sorry for my sin and I'm willing to turn away from my sin and I want to turn to you. But he says it's not only about repentance, it's faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith in what Jesus did. Faith in the fact that Jesus was your substitute on the cross of Calvary. Faith in the fact that Jesus died for you. That his, his blood was spilled for you. And that he was willing to wash you clean. And you put your faith. You put your whole life on him. You stand on him. God, I am depending on you. To take me to heaven. Because I have turned from my sin. And I have trusted you. Have you done that? Have you done that? A Japanese college student whose family were atheists decided to accept Christ as his savior. His dad demanded he change his mind. The dad, the atheist dad from Japan, here is this young man and sends this man, young fellow, to America to get a good education. And he learns that this guy has gotten Christianity. So he flies here and he demands that the young man give up this Christianity or he's going to be expelled. The young man he said, Dad, God has spoken to me and I must listen. His dad said, would you throw away everything for him? Would you give up your family and everything for God? The young man said, I would. His dad turned, walked out in disgust. That boy was discarded. I believe God has spoken to some of you. Will you give up everything for him? To live a life of significance, there is a cost. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. God has spoken. Will you say, hear my Lord. Lord, what will you have me? And if you're not saved, reach out. Save me, Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, help us now. God, the battle is now raging as the Spirit of God speaks to people and the devil tells them 
they don't have to act on this right now. God calls that there be some who will say, I'm tired of doing it my way. And God, I'm going to go your way. I'm going to give you my life. I, I want to make this sort of commitment like Paul. I want you to give me a life that at the end will have no regrets. A life that when I see you, I will hear from the lips of heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. For the person who needs salvation, help them to trust you now.